Um, first of all, thank you guys for coming. I know you're not here just to see me speak, so it's you're gonna you're in for a treat. Technori is a pretty awesome event. I've been to a handful of the events. Um, you're here to see some inspiring entrepreneurs, as Seth mentioned, entrepreneurs in a variety of stages of development. And so, as you guys in the crowd, as potential fans or potential customers or maybe even potential employees, investors, or partners, um, it's awesome that Chicago has this scene that's, that's growing and bubbling, and Technori obviously was at the start of that. So I was asked actually to tell my story, which I love doing. It's my mom's favorite story is actually my story. Um, and I've actually never done it with a, using a PowerPoint, which they asked me to do, so forgive me if I'm kind of <laughs> going back and forth. But um, so here's my story. And I wasn't sure if there's Q&A, but it looks like there is Q&A at the end, although I did plug some, some Q&A in um, towards the end. But here's my story. So I'm Matt Matros. I'm the founder of Protein Bar. Thank you to those that rose your hand who said you've attended or you've been to Protein Bar to eat. Protein Bar is a chain of healthy food, fast casual restaurants based here in Chicago. We have 20 locations open and operating across Chicagoland, Washington, D.C., Denver and Boulder, Colorado. We have another five or so in development towards the end of this year. Um, I'm also the board advisor of Farmed Here, which is the leading indoor vertical farm. It's a lot of words when it talks about farming. I'll explain exactly what indoor and vertical farming is a little bit later. And I'm actually starting a coffee business, which I'm going to talk just a little bit about. I'm not exactly too ready to tell the world about it, but I'm super pumped. So here's my story. And again, it's my first time using PowerPoint as I go, so forgive me. Um, so I grew up in California um, from Los Angeles, about an hour north, a small town called Palmdale. Um, I was there till I was 21 years old. I went to University of Southern California. But I grew up the fat kid. As you can see, that was me um, in 2001. A week after I turned 22, I was 210 pounds. Um, I've actually put a few pounds back on um, since I lost all my weight. But uh, after college, I was a sports agent for baseball players. I worked for a company called Beverly Hills Sports Council, a major baseball agency. We represent guys like Albert Pujols, Mike Piazza, Kurt Schilling, Jose Canseco, Trevor Hoffman, a number of others. That was the industry that I was in. Um, my father passed away when I was 11. He was 48. He had a heart attack. Uh, middle of the night, dropped dead. Um, and I noticed that when I was tw entering my 22nd year working for this, or fourth year working for the sports agency, 22nd year of living, I was sort of headed down this path. I mean, you saw me as the fat kid. Um, and I was just living an unhealthy lifestyle. So literally overnight, I had a Jerry Maguire-esque moment. I realized that I needed to, to change my life. So I actually committed to a high-protein diet. And in about a summer, a little over a summer, I actually lost... 50 pounds. So that's what I look like after I lost my weight. Like I said, I put a few pounds back on being in the restaurant industry. Um, but it was all thanks to a high protein diet. Fast forward a few years, I went to University of Michigan for business school. Probably the best years of my life. I had an awesome experience at Ross. Go Blue. Go Blue. Um, and then I came to Chicago to work for Kraft Foods. So I still can't say it with a straight face, but I was a brand manager of Kraft Cheese. Uh, so I was selling cheese for three and a half years. I worked on some pretty iconic brands, though, for Kraft. Kraft Singles, a billion dollar brand. Kraft Natural Cheese, a little bit over a billion. And the South Beach Diet brand of foods, which spanned across a number of different categories. So that's, where, that's what brought me here to Chicago. And um, that's what gave me my formal business education. While I was at Kraft, I, was, I discovered the sport of triathlon. So I really got into Chicago triathlon. That's me doing the Chicago Tri a few times. And I would work out at Lifetime Fitness in Old Orchard. And people ask all the time, like, how did Protein Bar, that idea, come, come to be? Well, I would work out at Lifetime Fitness um, every morning before going to my job at Kraft Foods. And I would get these shakes, these protein shakes that they sold in the Life Cafe. I actually found a Google Images of the Life Cafe shake that they would sell. Those shakes are about eight bucks, and they put these tiny scoops of protein in. So I did that after about a year and a half, and then I said, to heck with that. I'm going to start bringing my own baggies. So I literally would take baggies in the morning, fill them up with protein powder, a variety of mix-ins, and I would take it to the cafe after my workout. And they would charge me maybe $2 just to blend it up and for the cup and all that. And like any entrepreneur who solves a problem for themselves, ding, 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 that's when the light bulb went off. So on October 17, 2007, that's when I said, hey, I want to open a shake shop. So I spent, um, that was October of 07. I spent the next few months business planning. Uh, we won't get into the business planning process, but if any of you guys have questions on that specifically, we can talk about it afterwards. 
Um, very important process. Helps you be your own devil's advocate. Well, after business planning, I realized that I needed what I thought at the time was $440,000 to start the first protein bar. Where that was coming from was 220 of life savings, 220, which ended up being 320 of SBA loans, and then some credit card debt. Um, as I was business planning and starting the construction phase, I realized, oh crap, I'm going to be about 150 grand short. That's where that extra 100 of SBA came from, and that's where those 50 grand, 50 grand of credit cards went to. So that was my entire life savings. I was all in on this first protein bar location, which opened up across the street from the Sears Tower at the time, the now Willis Tower, um, on May 18th, 2009. When we first opened, we were just selling protein shakes. Womp womp, we were not doing very well. Um, I was trying to be more of a Jamba Juice competitor. Um, in fact, 91% of what we sell now wasn't on the original menu. I was mostly just trying to be a shake shop, which was the original concept. Um, doing about $2,000 a day in sales. We needed to be doing about $3,000 a day just to be breaking even, just to, just to, to, to pay the rent. Um, and out of mere survival, about eight months in, I added food to the menu. And that's when things took off. Those are the only pictures I had of huge long lines. But we had huge long lines. <laughs> They snaked through the restaurant. If any of you guys have been to that first location by Sears Tower, it's a little wonky. I've remodeled it like 10 times. Um, they snaked through the restaurant, and people were really starting to get behind the concept. Um, oh, sorry. And I started getting a number of questions like, you know, what is this? Is this like a franchise? Or, like, no, it, this is all me. This is everything. I'm pouring a shake or I'm wrapping a burrito. I'm starting to get to know the people that were coming into our stores. And we were developing a raving set of fans. I started thinking about expanding and growing, and I knew I needed capital to do that. Well, I was pretty much tapped out. I put all my life savings, I put everything I had into that first store, and then some. So I was tapped out. So then I said, well, shoot, if I want to grow, I need to get investors. And all these people that approached me about how, telling me how awesome Protein Bar were, was were all bankers and traders and attorneys that worked in the loop. Well, those guys came in and helped me grow. So the first person came in in August of 2010, and he put $285,000 into Protein Bar. That helped pay for store two. A few months later, we fundraised from you know, six more customers and 10 more of his friends, and we raised one three, and that paid for stores four and five. And then a few months later, as the business is rocking, we raised a little bit more dough. So we raised two million bucks for stores five, six, and seven, and some infrastructure. And then the same process happened again where we raised three, five um, from about 32 people, including the original investors. And that got us to about 12 stores across DC and Chicago. We were rocking. We were literally the hot girl at the dance, as I like to say. Picture of me and Mark Cuban, who was one of our guys who came in late. But we were humming. We, had, we were opening stores, and they were cranking. Well, the company got to be pretty big and bigger than me. And I realized that if I really wanted to put my foot on the gas and for Protein Bar to grow, the right thing for Protein Bar as a concept would be to partner with a private equity firm. Private equity, as it relates to heavy asset-intensive businesses like restaurants, can be a great source of fuel and grow. And October 1st, 2013, I sold about 60% of the business to Catterton Partners. The final number ended up being 25 million bucks. And that's what helped fuel our growth. So things were great. We got a bunch of money in the bank. We're starting to open stores. And this company is getting really big, bigger than me. And I realized that I needed some help. So about seven months, uh, about nine months after Catterton invested, they helped me bring in a president to help me run the company. And when Catterton, when, we knew, when, I, when they knew I needed help, Catterton said, do you want us to help you find a number two? Or do you want us to help you find a number two now that wants to be the number one? And I said, that. That's what I want. I want someone who eventually wants to be the CEO of the company. Because I did. I'm, I'm not a restaurant company CEO. I am a founder. I'm an entrepreneur. And it didn't take long, as you guys can see, from July when, when Samir started to November 15th when I named him the CEO. It wasn't long when I knew that this is the guy. Let him go run the show. Well, then what's next for me? Well, I wanted to take some time off. So from January 14th to April 4th, roughly, I traveled the world. So I was very fortunate to be able to take some time off 
Protein Bar changed the password on my email, so I couldn't claw back and try to see what was going on. They blocked me from all the social media, so I had no involvement in the business whatsoever. And it was funny because as I was traveling for the first week or so, it was sort of like when you hear like a war veteran who had their leg amputated, they keep reaching for that leg. That's kind of how it was for me in my email. I kept sliding my iPhone and nothing was coming in. And it wasn't, it took me about a week before I realized that, hey, chill out, you're not getting any more emails. So then I went around the world and the purpose of my trip was spiritual in nature, it was culinary in nature. I just sort of wanted to see how the world lived. Um, so overall I hit 15 countries across five continents, took a boatload of pictures, flew a ton of miles, went to a ton of airports, um, and just had really the, the time of my life. So now I'm back. Now what? Well, I come back and Protein Bar says, great, let's put you to work. And I said, you know what? I love Protein Bar, but there's so much more in the world that I want to do. And they said, okay, no big deal. You'll always be the founder. You'll always be the face of this business, but we're here to support you in doing whatever it is you wanted to do. Well, one thing that when I was traveling, I realized the, the stark contrast between obese Westerners, specifically Americans, and hungry pretty much everywhere else, right? And, and I started looking for ways to solve that problem. Vertical farming is a way to do that. So I'm talking to one of my best friends in the whole wide world. He was the guy I met in 2012, one of the smartest guys I know. He was a fellow Cranes 40 under 40 guy. And I was telling him about my trip, and he said, you know what, Matt, we actually just bought um, an indoor farm that's the leading indoor farm. And oh, by the way, they're looking for awesome leadership and people to help them out. So I got involved in indoor vertical farming. So what exactly is indoor vertical farming? So you may have heard of the expression hydroponic or aquaponic or aeroponic technology. All that really means is, is it's without the soil. So we grow organic produce indoors under LED lights. Um, these are beds that hold produce. In this instance, this is basil up there. That's kale. Um, more basil with me and my partners over there. Essentially, we grow produce under LED lights. It grows 24 hours a day. It solves about 11 of the top problems of traditional agriculture. I'll just run you through a few. Uh, indoor farming uses 97% less water than traditional farming. You're probably asking yourself, well, how is that? Well, we contain all of our water. Think about in Central Valley, in Salinas, California, where most of the lettuce and produce comes from. They're hosing it down. Well, this, that runoff ends up going into the rest of the atmosphere, or it goes into, um, into the atmosphere. Well, we contain for that. We're a pool, we're, we're fully circulated water. It's a fully controlled environment. So you think about all the food safety issues, specifically what happened with Chipotle recently with their E. coli outbreak. We can control for all that because it's fully indoors. Um, we're fully local. So now we can have produce to you that's grown and harvested and in your mouths in under 24 hours. Think about produce as a living being, right? Produce dies the second you snip it from the vine. Well, to the extent that you can get it into those mouths sooner, it's just alive longer, so therefore it's fresher, it's more nutritious. So everything is super right about this business. I can envision a thousand of these things in China one day. So I'm super excited about being involved in Farmed here. I'm also super passionate about the coffee industry. I never drank coffee until I got back from sabbatical. And I realized that not all coffee is created equally. So that's me and my partners down in... Um, El Salvador sourcing a bean that's, that's just cleaner. We like to talk about having a cleaner bean. Um, so therefore, I'm starting Limitless High Definition Coffee. Um, and that's my story. So in conclusion, I wasn't sure if we were going to have Q&A, so I kind of put together my own little Q&A, which I'll buzz through really fast because we actually do have Q&A. But a question that I get, these are probably literally the most frequently asked questions whenever I sit on panels or speak to entrepreneurs. And by the way, I feel like it's my duty as an entrepreneur to cascade information down to others who want it, which is why I'm so happy about being events like Tech Nori because I can help tell my story. And if it, if it helps someone in some sort of way, then, then I'm all the more excited for that. But question number one I get is, you put your life savings and everything you had into Protein Bar. Were you scared, and how certain were you that the risk was worth it? The short answer is, I had zero certainty, right? One thing that's scary about retail is that you put all this work into something and that you don't know how it's gonna do until you open your doors. As it relates to the risk, for me, it was simple. Um, I knew that 
this idea that I'd had, I was obsessed with. And I tell people all the time that the best idea in the world is the one that you're obsessed with because it won't go away. It doesn't mean it's going to be a success or not. But the second I had that idea for Protein Bar on October 17th, 07, I knew that this was the, the idea that I wanted to pursue. And I went at it relentlessly. So that sort of helped me manage the risk. The other thing for me, my worst case scenario wasn't so bad. So if, if I open Protein Bar and it fails, my worst case scenario is I file for bankruptcy, right? It sucks. It's not the best thing in the world. Your credit screwed for seven years. Um, number two, all my entire life savings is gone. It sucks, right? It's money out the window. And number three, I call Kraft and say, hey, can I have my very easy six-figure job back? Like, that's my worst case scenario? That's not a bad worst case scenario. And I imagine most of us here in this room are in that same camp, right? I'm guessing, by and large, we're all gainfully employed. We're all smart people. Our, our families love us. Never once did I say, if I open Protein Bar and it fails, my mom doesn't love me, or I'm out on the streets, or my kids can't eat. No. So the risk is relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Um, number two, who are your big mentors, and who do you turn to for advice? I'm sort of a contrarian when I tell entrepreneurs all the time that no one has ever started their business before. So what I mean by that is you need to trust your own gut because you have to live with those decisions. I'm not super big on mentors and advice because, again, Mark Zuckerberg had never started a social network before he started Facebook. He couldn't call the founders of MySpace or whatever existed before him. Um, Steve Ells, when he started Chipotle, he had never opened a burrito chain before. He couldn't call Ray Kroc and say, hey, how do I do this? And I always tell entrepreneurs that even if Steve Jobs and Steve Ells and Bill Gates were on protein bars board, they've never opened and operated a, pro a protein bar before. So the point being is have faith in yourself, have faith in the vision that you have for your, for your business, and focus on that and go at it relentlessly, like I did. Um, and number three, I get asked a question a lot. How do you know when to bring in a co-founder? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs ask that question out of fear. They're afraid that they don't have a certain skill set so that they want to bring someone else in. And I think that's the wrong reason to bring in a co-founder. Because as I said, Mark Zuckerberg had never started a social network before. So it's not like he could call someone and say, hey, come be my co-founder. Um, I was speaking to a woman this morning who wants to start kind of like a boxing gym, super cool idea the way she wants to do it. She's like, I really need to bring in an operator. I'm like, why? She's because I've never run a boxing gym before. I'm like, none of your other operators that you would bring in has ever run in Olivia's boxing studio or whatever the business happens to be. Same with me in Protein Bar. I could have hired a GM from Chipotle. I could have hired someone from Jamba Juice, but they've never run a protein bar before. So it's much different. So I... Point being, don't lose faith in yourself. Don't lose faith in your vision. Close your eyes and see your business in five months, five years, five decades from now, and go after that relentlessly. I loved helping out entrepreneurs, so if you need to, there's my email address. I'm also on all the cool techie things like Instagram and Twitter, at Matt Matros. Um, please eat lots of protein burritos, and pretty soon you'll be able to drink lots of low-talk and coffee from Limitless. And that's my story. And I guess I'll sit around for a few minutes. Right?